the JBL L52 Classic. I've got these in from a friend, a viewer, a fellow reviewer, Napier Lopez, who ordered them for himself and asked if I would be interested in measuring them and testing them out. And I said, sure, why not? They're a very interesting looking speaker. As you can see, they've got a walnut cabinet. The ones that I have on hand have a blue foam grill. I actually did my listening tests without the grill in place. I did measurements with the grill on and with the grill off. We'll talk about that later. I'm splitting up this review into two sections. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about what I heard in my demos before I talk about the measurements and before I saw the measurements. In my listening room, which is about 18 by 14 by nine foot ceilings, I position the speakers in different ways near the wall, away from the wall, aimed at me, aimed away from me. So with that in mind, I got to tell you, I'm just not a fan of these speakers. The response is all over the place. Aimed directly at me. There, I was listening to the Jay Jill's band, Centerfold. My love's been sold. My enemy's just been sold. Dang it, I'm messing that up. My blood turns cold. My memory has just been sold. My angel is a centerfold. Hey, John, is a beautiful. That song. I'm sure you know it by now. <laughs> Hopefully you do. If you want me to sing it again, leave a like and a comment below. <laughs> so that song starts off with a hand clap, right? And that hand clap is super aggressive with these speakers. And I thought, well, maybe it's the higher frequency. So I turned them away from me by about 30 degrees because I just figured I'm going to go extreme. I'm going to point them directly at the wall beside me or behind me. And in doing so, it got rid of that sharp hand clap, but there was no air around the hand clap anymore. And I thought, man, that's weird. So I actually went and Googled the frequencies for hand claps, and then I looked at the data. And around two and a half to five kilohertz is where there's the slap of the hand clap. When you turn the speakers off axis away from you and point them more out into the room, there's a strong peak around five kilohertz that drops. And in doing so, it actually alleviated that sound, that sharp sound of that hand clap. But the problem is the high frequency above 10 kilohertz dropped off too. So in alleviating that strong, sharp hand clap sound, it also completely got rid of the air of that sound. So then it sounded unnatural, but for a different reason. Initially, it sounded unnatural because it was way too sharp. And then the hand clap sounded unnatural because there was no air behind it. That was one issue. In listening to some other tracks, I noticed that male vocals were kind of hot, a little bit grainy, a little bit aggressive. The one thing that I do like about these speakers is they have some nice punch to them. Usually kick drums are like the 50 hertz arena, arena area. And depending on the actual instrument being played, it can be 40, 60 hertz, but it's in that ballpark. And the harmonics of it are usually around 100 hertz to 120 hertz. The harmonics are what gives it that sound of the punch, right? The fundamental, the 50 hertz, that's going to be that visceral, that impact. But the 100, 120 hertz region is going to be the sound of the impact. And so what I heard in most of my music was the sound of that impact. And I really like that. But what I noticed was that on some tracks where there's a little bit more, maybe a bit of a rumble to them intentionally because it's baked into the track, I didn't hear it with these speakers. I thought, well, you know, why am I hearing such impact, but I'm not hearing the rumble associated with that? And it turns out when, again, you look at the data, there's kind of a, a cue, like a mid cue peak around 100 hertz. That's what gives it that thump and that impact sound. But because it rolls off pretty sharply below that, that's why you don't have the rumble effect or the actual feeling of visceral vibration, attack, like it, it hits you in the chest and you can feel it, you just hear it. The other thing about these speakers that kind of was weird to me was that the soundstage width was doing one of these. Some songs were wide, some instruments were wide, some instruments were narrow. And it was weird because I'm trying to, like I listen and I listen with my eyes closed and I'm like, okay, the snare is over here, the hi-hat's over here, the vocalist is here. And I'm doing those things, right? I'm pointing things out in the soundstage. I open my eyes and I look, all right, well, if it's supposed to be far left, I hope that I'm pointing at least outside of the speaker. I'm not pointing directly at the speaker. If I am, that means it's a very narrow radiating speaker and the soundstage is just, 
just squished in. And I don't like that. I like a wider soundstage. But what I found was that I wasn't consistently pointing to the same spot. You know, if there's supposed to be two sounds, maybe a hi-hat and a piano were supposed to be pretty far out on the right-hand side of the soundstage. It was a tough sentence to put together. I might hear the piano to the right, but I might hear a hi-hat a little bit more inward. And I'm just thinking, oh, what, what's up with that? Now, not all speakers are going to behave very well in regards to how they spread their radiation pattern. It's not always even. Some of them will, will stay pretty even. That's constant directivity. Uh, Kef speakers, most waveguided speakers do a pretty good job of that as well. Two-way speakers, dome on a flat baffle, that kind of thing. They don't often do that as well. And usually they'll start narrowing up at the higher frequencies because the dome tweeter is starting to radiate and it's shrinking in this radiation pattern. So it's narrowing up. I get that. But with this particular speaker, I wasn't getting that. I wasn't hearing that. I was hearing different sounds at different frequencies, kind of at different places in the soundstage. And that indicates to me that the horizontal radiation pattern isn't really even, if you will. Uh, that actually shows up in the data too, because I was just looking at that a minute ago. I'm, I'm comparing my notes when I do these listens listen sessions, and then I go back and I look at the data. I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's probably why. But I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Snares. Snares, I love the sound of a good snare. I know that snare sound to live somewhere in the 800 to 1 kilohertz region. And I actually just Googled this to make sure that my mind was right. And 900 hertz, according to some pro audio mixing forums, is the fundamental frequency of where most snares are sitting. So I'm kind of in that ballpark. Now I say that to say this, the snares on these speakers didn't jump out and, and grab me. They actually sounded rather dull. And so when I was listening, that was one thing I noticed. I'm looking at the data and I'm not seeing anything wrong necessarily. It's, it's kind of smooth through the mid range up into about one kilohertz, but here's the kicker. At one kilohertz is where things just start getting wonky with these speakers. And one kilohertz is boosted about three decibels or so compared to about eight to 900 hertz. So what I'm thinking that I heard is, and I don't know, but this is kind of just my guess at it, is that because the treble and the lower mid range is boosted in some areas compared to that 900 hertz, 800 hertz fundamental area for a snare, that's why it sounded like the snares sounded more dull to me. Did anybody else notice that when I said me, it sounded like I said may, like it's gonna be may <laughs> for real. I'm losing it y'all. Um, so what I'm going to do now is that's going to be it for my subjective. I'm going to come back at a later date. I'm going to cover the measurement stuff and then I'll upload this thing. Oh, I also need to note before I go that when I was listening, I listened at the tweeter level, but also at the midwoofer level, it turns out that per the measurements, the midwoofer level actually looks like it's probably the most neutral spot, but you can play around with that and see what you think. I just don't think that I would go any higher than the tweeter level for sure. And I think that somewhere between maybe the mid woofer to between the mid woofer and the tweeter is probably going to be the best spot to listen to. And that's what I wound up listening to these at after I looked at the data and did a second round of listening. These speakers retail for about a thousand bucks, have a five and a quarter inch mid woofer and a three quarter inch titanium dome tweeter. Now the grill comes in three different flavors and depending on which version you get, you can get either blue, orange, or black. Personally, I've got the blue here in person. I think I kind of like the black, at least in the picture of it. There's also a tweeter knob on the front where you can drop the tweeter level or increase the tweeter level. Now, honestly, at zero dB where it comes by default, I think that's probably the best place to start with. Some of the high frequency issues that I had weren't total level adjustment fixable, if you will. Meaning that the response is so wonky in certain places that just adjusting the treble itself isn't going to solve those particular issues because the issues occur at certain frequencies, not as an overall trend in the treble. So let's talk about the data. The data that you're about to see is captured using the Clipple Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room. And all of the data 
is taken without the grill on. On my website, I do have data with the grill on. So I did test it with the grill on, but the performance is actually considerably worse. So all I'm showing you now is with the grill removed. If you wanna see the grill on, go to my website, aaronsaudiocorner.com. Frequency response is within about plus or minus three decibels. So it's actually, you know, in terms of the overall bandwidth that it covers, that's okay. But my issue here is that it's bouncing around. So you can see it's got a peak from one to about two kilohertz, then a dip around three kilohertz, and another peak from about three to four kilohertz, and then dip around five kilohertz, and then it flattens out. It's got a bass boost right here. Now the bass boost, honestly, is something that doesn't bother me. Sometimes I like a little bit of a bump there, as long as it's kind of mellow. Now, if this bass boost extended up plus five dB or something like that, it'd be a totally different ball game. I would definitely not like that. F3 is at 62 Hertz, F10 is at 45 Hertz with an average sensitivity of around 85 decibels. This is a CEA 2034 data set. Now, the cool thing about this particular data shows us that down here, if you look at ERDI, the more linear this is, not necessarily flat, not necessarily sloped with some kind of certain rake, but the more linear it is, the more equalizable the speaker is gonna be. So this three to four kilohertz region right here, because that's relatively flat or linear, you could equalize that down and have an overall better better sound. It'll get rid of that, that clap sound that really just jumped out at me that I didn't like. Uh, right through here, the one to two kilohertz region, you could also equalize some of that as well. Really what you would probably wind up doing is chopping off from about one to five kilohertz or so, bringing those down, and then that would give you a more neutral response overall. This is the estimated interim response aim directly at you and then aim 30 degrees off axis. Kind of what this picture is showing. Black is on axis, red is 30 degrees off axis. This line indicates basically what I heard. So this is a mix of subjective with objective. The objective data being the estimated in-room response and the subjective being my line. What I've called out here is there is punch in the bass but not extended bass. There is the dull snare sound that I heard around 800, 900 hertz. And I think that again is relative to the the peaking around one to two kilohertz. Then this sharp hand clap right here, I also noticed that. Hang on to that thought though. It actually turns out that if you position these speakers about 20 degrees off axis, it's probably the most overall linear in-room response, the most neutral. It's still not, still not great, but it, to me, it was the most acceptable angle of positioning these speakers. This is the horizontal contour plot. Normally you wanna see, again, linear right? But this is not linear. And in fact, it's not even symmetrical. That lack of symmetry is due most likely to the treble knob right here. And in this case, the diffraction is going to be due to the knobs that hold the grill in place. This is the vertical response. Again, remember I said that the best position vertically is actually at the mid woofer. So keep that in mind. It's not at the tweeter. Distortion at 86 decibels at one meter and 96 decibels at one meter. And I see some increase in distortion through the lower mid bass area around 100 Hertz and then in the treble. So this actually kind of concerns me and stands out as something that might show up in other testing. Speaking of other testing, let's look at the multi-tone distortion. Multi-tone distortion for me, this is not good at 96 decibels, but this is a smaller speaker. So realistically, I'm kind of gonna be, I don't wanna say I'm okay with it, but I think that when you're talking about speakers with a five and a quarter inch midwoofer and a small bookshelf size like these, You've also got to be realistic with your expectation of the distortion levels versus the output capability that it's going to have. So in that regard, maybe I could give it a pass, but I'm certain that if I looked, I could find other speakers that probably do better in distortion, but have an overall smaller cabinet. The interesting thing to me as I'm looking at this distortion is this higher frequency distortion. This one to two K or one and a half to two kilohertz area. And then this three, four, five kilohertz area right around here. That stands out to me, and I gotta be honest, I kind of wonder if the issue that I had with the claps and the J. Giles, is it J. Giles? I, you know, whatever. Centerfold song was due to this increased distortion. I mean, the distortion's pretty high overall. If you just look at it, normally what happens is you have lower distortion at lower outputs and then increasing as we go up. But in this case, the tweeter distortion is already pretty high, especially through this region, where if you look at the higher frequency distortion for the tweeter, it's it's not that high. I can't tell you for sure that the issues that I had with the higher frequency content was due to distortion or frequency response. 
except for the fact that I did play with equalization and equalizing around four kilohertz or so and bringing that down about two or three dB helped the sharpness that I was hearing. But I was also aware that I was equalizing it. So maybe bias was creeping in. It's an interesting idea to consider that distortion may have very well been a factor in the issues that I was hearing. Again, I was 10 feet away, uh, 18 by 14 by nine foot room, listening around 80 to 85 decibels in some cases, but also 70 decibels on the lower end. So what happens if you use a subwoofer? Will that alleviate some of that distortion? Well, what we see here is the answer is no, it won't alleviate the high frequency distortion. So again, this tells us that this is due to either breakup modes or the tweeter distortion itself because of where it is and how it's not affected by the use of a subwoofer high pass filter. But it does bring down the lower mid range, upper mid bass distortion right in this region. So I'm gonna go back and see how high this is. So if you do use a subwoofer, you can get rid of that distortion in this particular reason, region, I should say, and bring it down a little bit lower. Here we go with compression. Uh, again, this is kind of all over the map, kind of like the frequency response. It goes off the charts, literally, uh, below about mm, maybe 80, 70 hertz, somewhere in this region right there, which basically just tells you that for a five and a quarter inch woofer, you're not gonna be able to push it super duper hard. Now, the rest of this distortion region right up through here, I find it interesting that it's so, again, I use the word wonky because I don't have a better word to describe it. What I would typically expect or hope for is that this purple line will be somewhat linear, blue would be somewhat linear. In an ideal world, all of these color lines are stacked on top of this black line right here. And that would mean that there is basically unlimited dynamic range that as you increase the volume, the response of the speaker doesn't change. But in a real world, that doesn't happen. But in a best case scenario, what you would get is a more flat compression chart right through here, whereas this guy's bouncing all around. So that's interesting as well. So that does it for this review. I want to thank Napier again for loaning me this speaker to review. Um, you know, again, personally, I just didn't really care for it. Too many issues in response, possibly distortion. I was a little bit, little bit disappointed to see the distortion was as high as it was, you know, not necessarily in the the lower base or mid-range region, but just how high that one to five kilohertz distortion is even at lower volume. Take that for what it's worth. If you're interested in helping this channel, I would certainly appreciate it. You can do so a number of ways. One is you can support me at patreon.com. The other one is you can use any of my generic affiliate links in the comment section below, or I will also have affiliate link for this particular speaker. If you just like the look of it and you think, hey man, it doesn't look that bad to me, I'm gonna roll with it. If you use that affiliate link, that would help me and I would certainly appreciate it. I'll talk to you all in the next one. Take care, peace.